not they're not coming. Correct, correct. How are you doing? Okay. Good evening. We'd like to call the Durham City Council meeting to order uh, Monday, August the 19th, and certainly want to welcome all of you that are here with us this, e this evening. If we could just take a moment for silent meditation, please. I would ask Councilman Clement if he would lead us in the pledge.
Ask the clerk if she would call the roll, please. Mayor Bell. Present. Mayor Pro Tem Cole McFadden. Council Member Brown has an excused absence. Council Member Katati. Council Member Clement. Council Member Moffitt. And Council Member Shaw. Uh, this evening, I, I have the pleasure of recognizing some of our citizens for uh, being involved in an area that really isn't one of the core services of city government. Uh, it's an area that we take very much pride in and consider a very high priority, and that is of providing our young people in our community with job opportunities. And when I speak about young people, I'm talking about uh, persons from the ages of 14 to 22 years of age. Uh, some, as probably some of you know, that over the years we've had a program called the Mayor's Summer Youth Work Program. And this is a program that over the years has attempted to provide uh, gainful employment primarily during the summer for these young people. But it has been a program that the city has done by itself. Uh, we've had great partnerships with uh, Durham County government, uh, Duke University Hospital, and and others in the community and the private sector. As some of you probably know also in the last two to three years, both the uh, Durham County government, the Durham Public Schools, and the City Council has developed strategic plans. And these are plans which uh, we're using to help guide us in terms of the priorities that uh, the few governments uh, set as we try to develop a vision for uh, our operation. And as we've developed these plans, we've tried to do it in sort of a collaborative fashion once they've been developed. And by that I mean uh, both the public school administration, the county administration, and the city administration have come together to see where is there some intersection between these plans that uh, we can work cooperatively together. And one of the areas has been in the whole issue of job placement, internship for our young people. So during this past year, the program has sort of morphed in away from the Mayor's Summer Youth Work Program into a more collaborative effort between the public schools, county government, and city council, city government, into what we call the Durham Youth Work Internship Program. And what we've been able to do is to try to reach out not only to the bodies over, under which come in our jurisdiction, but to the private sector. And I would say as, as we, we've done this, I, I, I want to point out one particular city department that I'd like to commend while all the departments have participated in this program uh, over the years. Uh, one this past year is the Durham Parks and Recreation. And during this past year, they've hired over 180 plus young people in this physical year uh, to be a part of this program. Uh, this, this program ha has been to me not, not just a program for providing jobs and work opportunities for young people. Uh, it's also been an opportunity to introduce many of them to the what I call world of work. Uh, and I'm sure that uh, probably many of you who have grown up and have eventually gotten into the job uh, fair, uh, job, job uh, economy, uh, if like me, if I'd had this opportunity, I think I might have been a bit more prepared when I finally got into the uh, world of work. And we, we've had probably over 14 to 1,600 young people over the years that have applied for job positions. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we have not been able to place all those young people because we just haven't had jobs available. Uh, but what I've said to them, the ones that I've had an opportunity to speak to, that uh, even if you don't get a job, if you come to the workshops, uh, come to the job fairs, uh, you gain something just by going through the experience of filling out applications uh, talking to potential employers to find out what they're looking for, and hopefully it'll stead you better as you, as you move forward. But this year, what we like to do is to recognize, in particular, uh, some of the companies that have participated in this program and have provided the types of services, job services, that we've been looking for. And again, this has moved from just a summer program into a year-round internship program, so it's not just for the summer that these young people are working. But some will be employed gainfully uh, throughout, throughout the year. Uh, what I'd like to do, if you don't mind, is ask at least two of my colleagues who have been involved in the uh, Workforce Development Program to, to join me, uh, Councilwoman Diane Katati and Councilman Steve Shul, uh, as we present these certificates. 
probably wanted to go down there, uh, as we present these certificates to uh, some of the companies that are here tonight. And this, this isn't all the companies, but I know I signed more certificates than uh, we have people here. But uh, and this is sort of a small token uh, from the city council, from the Durham Public Schools, and from Durham County government to show our appreciation for, for what you've done and hopefully what you will continue to do as we try to find opportunities for young people in our community. So as I call your name, if you don't mind, if you could come up uh, and receive the certificate and uh, stay there, and we'd like to take a group photo, photo at, at the appropriate time. Uh, representing Gail's hair salon, uh, Tommy and Gail McNeil. Representing Kimberly Horn and Associates, Earl Llewellyn. Is Earl here? Thank you. Uh, representing Blue Cross Blue Shield of North Carolina, Kara Taft. Uh, representing the Durham Bulls Baseball Club, Theresa Stocking and Mike Browning. Representing Durham Technical Community College, Catherine McKinley. <laughs> representing, representing Census, uh, Stephen Williams, who chairs the uh, Durham Workforce Board, and Randolph Wheatley. <laughs> representing East Cycling, I have to admit, I was wondering for a long time what was happening over the former Chrysler site, but uh, now I know representing e-cycling is Larry Hurst. Okay. Representing Regency Cleaners, Ms. Rita Foley. Representing Haytai Heritage Center, the Executive Director, Angela Lee. And representing Walmart, Richardo Robinson. Is Richardo here? Okay, thank you. And finally, but not least, representing Duke Medicine, Priscilla Ramsour. <laughs> now, I, I want to make sure I haven't missed anyone. These are the list of names. I know I signed more certificates, so is there anyone else here whose name I did not call that I, I should have called as a part of this group? Uh, don't feel embarrassed uh, because we don't want to forget you. Uh, if, that's, if that's the case, then uh, again, we appreciate what you're doing. I guess they want us to take sort of a group, group photo.
we, we have uh, one other presentation that we would like to make is sort of in conjunction uh, with the workforce program in terms of jobs. Uh, it's one thing to have a job, it's one thing to get money once you're working. It's another thing to be able to handle your, your finances. And there's a program that's called Dollar Wise Mayors for Financial Literacy. And this is the official financial education and summer youth job initiative of the United States Conference of Mayors and its Council on Metro Economies and the New American City. Uh, this program was conceived in 2004 and mayors and cities across America have made a commitment to increasing access to financial education for the citizens by participating in dollar-wise in initiatives. Now this is the first year that the city of Durham has participated in the program through the Durham Youth, Youth Work Initiative Interns Program. Uh, we're very proud that one of our students has achieved excellence in going through the online program and that he was lucky enough to win a Kindle. Ronald Bethay, who is the son of Mr. and Mrs. Ronald Bethay Sr., if you'll join me please. Uh, Ronald worked this summer through the Durham Youth Work Internship Program for the City of Durham's Regulatory Compliance Laboratory Services. He is at school at the J.D. Clement Early College High School. And I again want to congratulate Ronald for one, uh, making the choice to become involved in the program itself and then taking the additional choice of enrolling himself in this online program. And so I want to congratulate Ronald again and certainly want to congratulate his parents and present him with this Amazon Kindle for his work and leadership in this particular program. I would like to thank the mayor and the council for that opportunity. One year we didn't get in, but we kept trying. So, and he is a good boy. <laughs> so I, I am so glad he is getting recognized tonight. Thank you for doing this for him. Let me ask, are there any comments by members of the city council? Recognize Councilman Clement. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. First of all, I want to uh, assure you that it's a privilege for me to be here tonight. And thank you so much for your patience and perseverance. Uh, I want to take this opportunity to congratulate uh, my colleague, Mayor Pro Tem, Cora Cole McFadden. She was recognized the other night at a banquet underwritten by the Durham Committee on the Affairs of Black People, and I want to congratulate you, Thank you sir. Mayor Cole, Cora Cole McFadden. I also want to commend Kenneth Spaulding, gentleman sit, sitting in the rear. He was also recognized for his stellar work in the Durham community by the Durham Committee on the Affairs of Black People. We congratulate you, Ken. Uh, John Harding Lewis, John Harding Lucas. He's going to live forever, and I'm, <laughs> and I'm, I'm glad. I, I'm going to be around just to make sure he does. <laughs> But uh, he was also recognized by the Durham Committee, and I want to commend these fine individuals, Dr. Lucas, Mayor Pro Tem, Cora Cole McFadden, and Ken Spaulding for their stellar work to make Durham a great community to live and work. 
congratulations to all of you. Maybe we give these folks a big hand. Any other comments? If not, I would ask other priority items by the city manager. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good evening, everyone. No priority items. Uh, likewise, the city attorney. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. No priority items. And likewise, the city clerk. No items, Mr. Mayor. In that case, we'll proceed with the agenda as printed. Uh, as you know, the consent agenda items may be approved with a single vote if either a council member or someone from the audience pulls a a consent agenda item, uh, we recognize them and recognize that item later in the program. And I'll again just read the heading of each consent agenda item. Item one is Human Relations Commission appointment. Item two is Citizens Advisory Committee appointment. Item three is adopt preliminary assessment roles and set public hearings for confirmation of Ed Cook Road, Ardmore Drive, Valley Springs Road, and Rivermont Road, and Valley Springs Road, Rose Road, and Forestdale Road. Item four is street acceptances. Item five is amendment to interlocal agreement with Durham County for joint disparity study. Item six is a resolution authorizing the issuance of limited obligation bonds series 2013A and 2013B. Item eight is license agreement with Carolina Arbors by Del Webb Homeowners Association. Item nine is Parks and Recreation Master Plan. I recognize Councilman Shule has a comment on that. Do you want to do it now, Steve? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I just wanted, uh, we're going to pass this on consent, and that's great, but I, I didn't want it to go by without just commenting for people who are in the public uh, and who may be watching us uh, who might not understand the tremendous amount of work that goes into, went into this uh, report. Uh, Rhonda Parker and Beth Timpson are here from from the Department of Parks and Rec, and uh, the department did this strategic plan. It's 170 some pages uh, in house. It's a strategic plan that we did without hiring a consultant. They did it on their own time, in addition to their usual work running the Department of Parks and Rec. And it's an extensive plan for how to improve uh, Parks and Rec and all the um, the kinds of associated things here in Durham, um, trails and parks and everything else that we value so much. And it, it isn't just a facilities plan. Um, we've had some good articles in the paper concerning the, the, the maintenance aspect of this, uh, but it also includes uh, many of the other uh, aspects of running parks and rec besides maintenance. For example, staffing. Uh, for example, how we compare to our peer cities. For example, what uh, facilities that, we, that the citizens want and that we need, ways in which we are above or below other cities that are our peer cities. It, is a, it, it talks about uh, the programs that we want, not, nothing to do with facilities in some cases, often just the programs that we want and need that, that, we, uh, that, that our citizens want here in Durham. So I just wanted to say that, Mr. Mayor, because I didn't want to go by without being noted that this is a, a really uh, excellent and uh, thorough piece of work and that we can get a lot out of it. Uh, so. Uh, and, and then I, I wanted to say the, the final thing is it really included a lot of public input. There was a master plan steering committee, members of the committee, and then uh, a lot of outreach into the community to try to get these opinions. So I just wanted to uh, let people know that, Mr. Mayor, and I appreciate your letting me make those comments. Well, thank you, Steve, and I, I certainly would concur, and I think all of council members are concerned. I think it was a, an excellent report, uh, especially considering the fact that it was all done internal about his staff and, as you indicated, received a considerable amount of public input in this development. And uh, we look forward to hearing from the administration on more details as how we try to implement that. Uh, items 10 through 12 are items that can be found on the general business agenda as public hearing. Well, that concludes the consent agenda. I entertain a motion for the approval of the consent agenda. Second. It's been properly moved and seconded. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? You close the vote. It passes six to zero. Uh, we'll move to the general business agenda for public hearings. Uh, and item 10 is assessment improvements. Item 10 is mini assessment role for water main on Dawfield Road. Good evening, Mayor Bell, members of council. I'm Nathan McHenry, Public Works and Engineering Services. Uh, item 10 is a mini assessment role for the confirmation of the water main assessment on Donfield Road. The assessment role was originally confirmed at the May 6, 2013 council meeting with the exception of the property at 1205 Donful Road. The property owner objected to the assessment at that time, 
The assessment was pulled for, from the roll for further review. Staff has reviewed the item and determined that there are no grounds under the current council approved relief criteria that would qualify this property for relief from this assessment. As a result, staff recommends that the assessment against 1205 Donville Road be confirmed in the original amount of $2,012.50. Thank you. This is a public hearing. I would ask first are there comments by members of the council on the staff report on this public hearing item? Uh, likewise, I would ask is that anyone in the public that wants to speak on this item? Uh, let the record reflect that no one in the public asked to speak on this item. I would try to put in and close matters back before the council. It's been properly moved and second. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes six to zero. Okay. I, I've indicated to the council at work session that this next uh, assessment, item 12, economic development, historic, I'm sorry, mini assessment role for sewer main on East Cornwallis Road. I'm going to be asked to be excused from participating in this item as it uh, impacts a uh, company that I work for, UDI CDC. So I would ask the Mayor Pro Tem if she would. Uh, carry this item. This is item 11. Item 11 is mini assessment road for sewer main on East Cornwallis Road. Um, is there a report from staff on this? Again, item 11 is a mini assessment role for the confirmation of the sewer main assessment on East Cornwallis Road. The assessment role was originally confirmed at the November 5, 2012 council meeting with the exception of the property of 4601 Industry Lane and the properties at 1602 and 1604 East Cornwallis Road. The property owners objected to the assessment at that time, and those assessments were pulled from the roll for further review. Staff has reviewed the items and determined that there are no grounds under the current council approved relief criteria that would qualify these properties for relief from these assessments. As a result, staff recommends that these assessments against 4601 Industry Lane, 1602, and 1604 East Cornwallis Road be confirmed in their original amounts. You've heard the report from staff. Are there any questions from council members? If not, I'll open the public hearing. Are there persons who desire to speak? Is that? Are there persons who desire to speak on this item? We recognize you, Mr. Stewart. You have three minutes, sir. <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. <clears throat> Good evening to the members of the council. My name is uh, Ed Stewart. I serve as president of UDI Community Development Corporation. And I come before you to request that you <clears throat> waive this charge, this assessment against UDI because of the following reasons. <clears throat> First, let me speak to the fact of failure to receive a public notice. That notice was never received by UDI to attend the public meeting. And the reason being is that UDI had uh, closed this postal box and was receiving mail at his office. Notices were sent as a good business practice that we have was sent to all of my business associates. And consequently, to, as evidence of this, we did receive tax notices from the city and the county, but we did not receive this notice about the public hearing. So, of course, we missed that. <clears throat> when approached by Mr. Lecky, Mr. Lecky is the supervisor of engineering for the uh, engineering design for the city of Durham. Uh, when approached by him <clears throat> regarding a land swap to accommodate a, ne a necessary easement for the extension of a sewer out outfall in response to a request by the Durham County Health Department because of a failed septic system on Cornwallis Road, I asked him, if we agreed to the swap, would there be a cost to UDI? I was told no. <clears throat> Another question, <clears throat> uh, in the meantime, <clears throat> The swap, I was asked, uh, excuse me, I also referred to the question of would there be certain values accruing to the city? And of course, that answer was also no. In the meantime, the swap referred to as a sewer improvement, and I 
refer to that simply because of a comment of the, because of an email that I received from Mr. Marvin Williams, who is with the city. Those comments are, <coughs> to follow up on a conversion for, these, for this afternoon about assessments that UDI would be responsible for due to the sewer improvements on East Cornwallis Road, I would like to offer the following information for your review. On November 5th, the City Council confirmed the assessment against certain properties along East Cornwallis Road for a sewer main improvement. That has been recently completed. One of the properties that would be assessed for this improvement, 40601 Industry Lane, is property owned by UDI. That couldn't be, is that right? That, that's your three minutes is up. Do you have uh, something that we can, something for our record that we can uh, just look at too? But le is there a response from as Martin. far as the notices being sent to the, to the post office box, that is correct. The original notice to advise of the public hearing for the order, ordering of the project was sent October 25, 2010. Uh, the project was subsequently ordered on November 15th of that year, and a notice was sent out on November 23rd, 2010, advising the property owners of the uh, ordering of the project. None of these uh, notices were returned to us uh, by the post office. Uh, we determine addresses by going into the land records database. This is our normal procedure for determining any address, and that is the address of record uh, for UDI. Uh, it is checking the tax bills. Recently, it is still that because we, we want to make sure folks get the get the information. The only letter that came back was the letter that was sent for the original uh, assessment hearing uh, that did get returned to us and we notified Mr. Stewart uh, via email, talked to him on the phone. A lot of uh, conversations have gone back and forth since then. So we feel that we've done what we need to do as far as the notification. Uh, as far as the land swap issue, I'm gonna defer to Jeff uh, Leckie. Yes, I'm Jeff Leckie with, engin excuse me, <clears throat> with engineering. Uh, there was a discussion regarding a land swap the only idea behind that, of course, was they had some land and we needed some land, just a land swap. I was very clear that I had no authority to waive any fees. When did this occur, sir? Um, about a year and a half ago. Could I, could I respond to this cost, uh, issue about this cost? and the accruements that might, uh, in a statement that I received from Mr. Williams, in reference, and I, I speak now about the accru uh, what, might, what values might accrue to the city. I read this statement. The decision was made to design and construct the line through the UDI easement to allow for only one sewer main in this area to serve the entire basin that all will ultimately request or either require sewer services from the city. The installation of one sewer line also assisted with minimizing buffer intrusions, sewer outfall maintenance uh, needs, and sewer line in reference to the construction of, of con in reference for the constructed sewer line and the alternative original assessments. In other words, it is saying these are certain benefits that will accrue to the city, if not immediately, certainly in the long range. So in my mind, when I say, are there are some uh, assessments that will accrue, uh, are there some uh, benefits that will accrue to the city, in my mind, this statement clearly uh, speaks oppositely to what was told me. Mr. M well, again, the, the, uh, the sewer main was built at the request of the Durham County Health Department because of the failing septic system. When we design a sewer, we endeavor to cover properties within that basin. It was determined there were only a few lots left to uh, serve by extending the sewer, whether we had gone down the original easement that was on UDI property or did the land swap for the secondary easement. Uh, the assessment still would have remained 
It's just that we took the sewer across the front of the property rather than going down uh, through the middle. So I, I'm, I'm not really sure how to respond other than that. So. That Tom, doesn't speak to the... Just, just a moment, sir. Could, could one of you gentlemen also uh, clarify you know, the, the question about the benefit to the properties in question? And, and, and will they, and do, do they in fact have sewer service now or will yeah, they? Yes, sir. All the properties in that area, the UDI property, the properties across the street and four properties just to the east of the UDI property now have the benefit of sewer service. It is a benefit to the property that does increase their value. Uh, it also takes a failed septic system out of the uh, system. This, this property at 1507 East Cornwallis was discharging raw sewage. Uh, again, the building of the main and the subsequent outfall alleviates that. But previously, they didn't. Those properties did not have access. They did to not have sewer access. System. The uh, the UDI property did through an outfall to the rear, uh, but the other properties within this assessment did not. <clears throat> so again, let me clarify. So the the UDI property already had sewer service. There was a sewer outfall to the rear of the property that was in existence. Yes, sir. However, when we build a sewer main under an ordered project, it is practiced to assess this property. Right, but just again clarify the benefit question. I think there's still some uncertainty about that. If they already had sewer, how are they benefiting by this this construction? Again, they you know it's you you could say that they had the sewer there previously, uh, and they were already benefiting from it. Uh, you guys want to <laughs> give your two bits here? The answer to the question is Robert Joyner, uh, head of development review for Public Works Engineering. Um, the existing property did already have access to sewer. Uh, therefore, extending sewer across a property does not necessarily acquire any additional benefit to that property. So is that the property that we're talking about that will be assessed because of that benefit? Yes, sir. And that's consistent with city policy? It has been consistent with city policy and how these uh, Projects have been assessed in the past, yes, sir. It really makes no sense to me, but Don, you had a. Yes. Um, I wanted to start. I, I've been kind of holding back, but um, I, I don't have a. I, I would like a more information than we have in front of us. Um, so I, I would like a map. I'd like to know what we're talking about with a land swap. I'd like to know if he would have been assessed on the land that he swapped to the city, if he was assessed on the land that he received from the city, if that, um, if they're comparable. And um, what I would suggest, given that we don't have this information in front of us, and particularly given what we just heard from Mr. Joyner, that there was no actual, if I understood you correctly, they were already on the sanitary sewer. And there is sewer uh, available. It's, it, it's all the way to the microphone. Sanitary sewer would be available for them to tie into. I believe this property is not using that sanitary sewer at this time. But, but, but they already had that availability is what I heard you say. They had the ability to access that sewer. That is correct. Right, okay. So no further benefit accruing from the, the newly installed line? The benefit for a sanitary sewer line across a property is a difficult question to answer. If all of the property were to be developed and it could all pass down to that central source, um, that would be one thing. However, extending the outfall, depending on how the property is developed in the future, could actually provide a benefit to the uh, owner of that property because it would provide perhaps better access to any proposed building in the future. It would be a shorter run of sewer for them to tie onto it, et cetera. It's dependent particularly upon the layout of the plan, to be quite honest. May I speak to that? Just, just, just a moment. Okay. Uh, I have a comment from Mr. Shul and then Ms. Katati. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, can we send this back? I, I don't yes. think that I'm going to be able to figure this out myself tonight by hearing these things. And it would be good for me anyway if we could send this back, get a little bit more information. And okay. I, I know I feel a much higher comfort level. Can, Ms. Katati. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Two points. One is I'm hearing that they're not actually connected, so I think I need some clarity about whether they're eligible for relief until tap on, so to speak. Um, and then the second point is I, I concur that I'm not prepared to take action on this item, but 
If there is no objection and no one else speaking, I would suggest, and I believe the attorney has confirmed privately, that we can take action on Clause B. So I'd like to actually continue to vote on 11B and send 11C back. Did the clerk understand that? Okay, all right. Oh, I'm sorry, would the motion be to continue 11C for two weeks so that we don't have to re-advertise? Then we can see that the uh, or do you need four weeks, Mr. Manager? The, the four weeks would be. Okay. Excuse me. I, I don't have an agenda. Do we can I get an understanding of what is 11B and what is 11C and what we're doing? Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Madam Clerk, would you open the vote? Close the vote. The motion passes six to zero. I'm sorry. Five to zero, Mayor Bill abstaining. Thank you, ma'am. Members of the council. We'll move to item 12, Economic Development Historic Property Preservation Agreement with Corncourt Hospitality Enterprises Company for capital investments in historic property preservation of 1108 West Main Street. Good evening, Mayor Bell, members of council, city staff, Durham residents and businesses. I'm Kevin Dick, I'm with the Office of Economic and Workforce Development, and I'm pleased this evening to have the opportunity to present a recommended uh, economic development incentive agreement uh, between the city of Durham and Concord Hospitality Group. Um, the proposed project would be uh, located at 11108 West Main Street at the western edge of downtown. Uh, a few points about Concord Hospitality Enterprises. Um, they have been in business for 25 years. Um, currently they provide management services uh, for over 90 hotels and 12,600 guest rooms uh, and suites throughout the United States and Canada. Um, they have been a contributor to uh, significant local civic causes, um, including the Durham Rescue Mission and um, the Oakwood Park uh, renovation that uh, we hope to soon be underway. Uh, just a bit about the location where the project is being proposed. Um, it is, as I said, at the western edge of downtown. Um, the slide before you is an aerial view. This is another area of aerial view. And you'll note that uh, toward the middle of this picture um, is actually the, uh, the proposed preservation of McPherson Eye and Ear Hospital. So the middle part of the building, um, or the, the middle part of the uh, front facade uh, actually is the uh, old McPherson Eye and, Eye, and Eye and Ear Hospital. And <laughs> Ear and ear, nose and throat, and so forth and so on. Hospital, and um, basically the, the preservation of this part of the uh, the uh, building is a is a very significant part of the historical preservation benefits of this project. This is a view of what the um, proposed hotel is due to look like from the western side, and this is a frontal view. I want to talk briefly for why an incentive is being proposed. Um, firstly, the incentive uh, offered by the city would help offset a financial gap uh, caused by an increased construction costs associated with historical rehabilitation. Um, the project would not be completed without the pro proposed incentive. The property would likely be sold, um, and it would likely also continue to deteriorate um, in the interim and likely cost more to rehabilitate in the future. How the project benefits Durham, uh, we'd be gaining 143 rooms, advancing toward the, the adopted goal of 700 rooms in our downtown. Um, this uh, residence in would be an upscale select service property. 
Uh, as I said, it incorporates the historical design um, into the hotel structure uh, consistent with the image and historical characteristics of the Trinity Park neighborhood. And as I said, it preserves uh, the, the uh, uh, historic hospital building. Um, another advantage is that the Bull City Connector stops directly in front of the hotel and is a short drive from our convention center. So we may um, reap benefits in terms of um, uh, space in the convention center being booked for meetings uh, by travelers to this hotel. In terms of job creation and business uh, development, um, 31 full-time uh, jobs with benefits are anticipated with approximately 50% paying above the livable wage, including eight salary positions, um, as well as 14 part-time positions. Uh, we have um, uh, facilitated contact with uh, between um, the uh, NCCU Hospitality Program, um, the Durham Job Link Career Center, um, and uh, we'll be scheduling meetings shortly with um, Concord Hospitality to ensure that um, Durham residents and graduates um, from those, those um, institutions have an opportunity to compete for jobs with the hotel and that is a part of the Durham workforce plan that is attached to the uh, proposed agreement. We will also connect uh, Concord with Durham-based businesses through our Durham-based business plan. Um, as part of that plan um, and as part of the database that uh, is, is associated with the plan, we have Durham-based uh, minority and women-owned businesses that are registered with the city's Office of e Equal Opportunity and Equity Assurance. In addition, we have placed advertisements to become part of the Durham, base, uh, Durham uh, business uh, database related to construction opportunities. Uh, we have placed advertisements in the Durham Herald Sun, the Durham News, the Carolina Times, the Triangle Tribune, La Noticia, and Que Pasa, uh, so that we can expand um, the opportunities um, related to uh, this uh, hotel project and other construction projects uh, that we may be associated with in the future. Finally, and in summary, why this is a good deal for uh, Durham taxpayers. Um, at a property tax, at the prevailing city's uh, property tax rate, um, we are expected to gain uh, property taxes of over $640,000 uh, in the eight year life of this um, incentive agreement. With the, the prevailing occupancy tax and sales tax rates, um, we're also, uh, we also anticipate producing um, over $1.13 million over the eight years of the incentive agreement um, in revenues from those sources. Uh, the proposed incentives at uh, just over $1.33 million would yield um, a net gain of over $446,000 over eight years. Um, as I said earlier, the project cannot be done without the incentive. Uh, therefore, the incentive is really an investment that garners the city the, the uh, projected returns that I listed earlier. Um, and as also, as I said earlier, uh, this project would create hospitality positions and possible business opportunities um, for local Durham businesses. And finally, and this is not on the slide, but I did want to add that um, this project would rehabilitate um, a, a property that, that is uh, more or less dilapidated and that is currently a gateway into downtown, into West Durham, and into the Trinity Park neighborhood. So it, it actually um, aesthetically uh, has a, a significant aesthetic effect on the, um, that area and the surrounding area. And so that concludes my presentation, but before, um, uh, before uh, the presentation is fully finished, um, I did uh, want to acknowledge uh, representatives from the Concord Hospitality Group and after uh, council comments and, and questions from the public, um, they may want to address the council. Thank you. You've heard the um, staff report. This is a public hearing. The public hearing is open. Uh, we have persons that are signed up to speak, but I want to recognize the mayor pro tem. I thought I saw her hand. Yes, you did. I have a question about something that you said. Well, something that was on the presentation. You stated that 50% of the 31 full-time positions pay above the living wage. How about the other 50%? Are they at livable wage or? They are likely below livable wage because they're service jobs related to a hotel. 
and, and generally the, the market rate for those types of positions is not at livable wage. Well, this, I'm, I'm really concerned about that because those are very important positions. They have, um, people have to pay rent and buy food and insurance and all those things so they deserve a living wage no matter what the job is. And so there's this stereotypic piece that uh, tends to get in the way of that, and I'm, I'm concerned about that. Uh, let, let, let me make a comment on, on that, because I, there are some other pieces in here that I, I think have been spoken to. Uh, for me, the, the reason is, is critical that this whole issue of uh, livable wage, uh, minority participation in this, this project, is the fact that we're putting city money into it. I mean, if, if you were coming before us just asking for a simple rezoning, we still might ask you those questions. But I think we have less of a leverage if we weren't putting anything to it. But we, you, you're asking us to put a considerable amount of dollars into this project. And as a result, uh, I think it behooves us to have a comfortable feeling uh, that you, you're not only going to try to do what you can do in terms of uh, wages, but also the participation by minorities, women, in this program, in this project. And I, I think I hope to hear a little bit of this when you make your presentation. I, I see that uh, this, you have a plan here, but I, I just want to hear it from, from the developers as, as we move forward. So I, I would hope that would be a part of your, your comments as you uh, respond to questions or you make a presentation. I'm going to ask are there other persons that recognize Councilman Katati and Councilman Clement. Thank you, Mayor. I just had a question about the jobs as well. Um, I didn't see it in attachment A or B. Is it just an expected number of positions, but no guarantee of actual number of positions? It's an anticipated number of positions at this point based upon the size of the hotel and the number of rooms. Recognize Councilman Clement. Just to clarify matters, I've always thought that the living wage concept permeated throughout the entire work structure of the Durham city government and that uh, it was the understanding that any employee group that sought work with the city government using, of course, public monies to facilitate this process, that it was a matter of course, it was a matter of course that the living wage approach that this council has adopted, and I'm being repetitive, will permeate through all of our work relationships. Am I to understand that this doesn't prevail with respect to this particular contract? Uh, well, it does not prevail with all of the positions that are anticipated. Um, uh, the past uh, incentive projects that have been brought to council, um, whenever it's been a either a, uh, a job creation incentive where the actual jobs were being incentivized, we do have as a stipulation in our policy that all jobs will be livable wage. That's not the case with this project. And nor has it been the case with other hotel projects that we, the council has voted to incentivize in the past. In other words, with hotels and hospitality and tourism, um, the, the market rates for positions in that industry uh, are not, do not always yield positions that pay above the prevailing Durham livable wage. Um, in this case, as I said, over 50% would, but that has not been the case with um, other recent hotel projects we've incentivized. Just one more comment, Mr. Mayor. I, I, I just don't recall that that exclusion existed for these type of workers. I thought all work being consummated with the city and the use of public monies was subject to livable wage. And I thought that was the standing uh, procedure. Apparently, I was incorrect. Oh, y'all need to clarify that for me because 
I, I don't see how people who work with the city using public monies, I don't see how they can survive if they didn't have livable wage. So I just don't recall that that being an, ex an exclusion. And if, that's, if, that, if there is an exclusion to that effect, covering the employees that Mr. Dick uh, mentioned, uh, so be it. But is that the policy? Councilman Clement, I don't have the exact um, uh, livable wage ordinance in front of me. Uh, generally speaking, however, when the city enters into a contract with an entity in which the city could uh, do the contract with its own forces, then yes, uh, we would uh, apply a livable wage. Uh, but if the city couldn't do the work with its own forces, then the, the ordinance isn't applicable. That's right off the top of my head. And in this particular case, uh, this is an incentive to a, to a group, and it wouldn't uh, I mean, those questions will come up in terms of whether you want to give the incentive, uh, but it wouldn't fall under the, uh, the exact terms of our ordinance. Yeah, if, I, if I could just say as well, I think that, that I agree with, with Mr. Baker. We, we contract with many, many, many entities, uh, Mr. Clement, that uh, we don't enforce a, uh, the livable wage because they're not providing a service the city would otherwise be providing. In those situations where we do contract, uh, uh, for services that the city would otherwise be providing, that's where we impose the uh, the livable wage requirement. Ms. Page, do you have anything to add to that? Is that your understanding as well? Thank you. I want to recognize a different Mr. Manager. Yes. I recognize the Mayor Pro Tem and then Councilman Moffitt. Mr. Attorney, is it legal to ask them to pay employees a livable wage? Legal, sure, it's, it's legal to ask that question, but ultimately you're going to make a decision that uh, on this incentive, whether you want to, to give the incentive or not. Um, yes, uh, and, and, and the reason, uh, Mr. Dick, that um, I'm asking this question this evening, I don't remember you sort of emphasizing that 50% of the jobs would be over a livable wage, and that's what brought on the question of how about the other 50%. Now, if our attitude is that service-related jobs really don't deserve uh, that consideration, I'm truly concerned. Because as we talk about affordable housing in Durham, if people don't have affordable money, they can't afford anything. And so that's why I'm emphasizing the, emphasizing the importance of our being sensitive to the needs of low-paying jobs uh, in this city because people need to be able to live. Uh, they need to be able to pay house payments or rent or light bill what, what, and dollars don't stretch. So I think we have a responsibility to at least pose the question to anybody now and in the future who is asking for money from the city. That's just where I am in my walk. Thank you, sir. That's Councilman Moffitt. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, since I joined council in January, I, I believe that we voted twice on incentives, once for uh, GE, where the jobs were li a livable wage, and once for Witted School, where I don't think we asked the question. Um, and, and then recently there have been other hospitality projects like 21C, the hotel on Chapel Hill Street, and I'm not aware that the question was asked then. Um, I can say that uh, I have looked at the city incentive programs as a potential applicant prior to forming, uh, joining council. And there are a number of, of different programs that the city has, some based on job creation, which require a livable wage, some based on being a catalyst of development in certain communities or redevelopment. And correct me if I'm wrong, please, Mr. Dick. But I, I'm not aware of those particular, yeah, um, I've done uh, retail improvement grants, um, a, a number of different kinds of grants that are available through your office which are not tied to livable wage. Now, I'm not disagreeing that a livable wage is very important, but I am looking, I mean, I'm thinking that if we want to make sure that all of our applicants pay a living wage, then that should be in the policy. 
and should be clear from the, from the beginning. Am I correct in that when I loosely describe some of these programs that they don't require a living wage? Sir, you're correct. Um, the, the programs that have been defined in the policy you alluded to, which was approved by council in April 2011, do stipulate um, job creation incentives, um, mandating that all of the positions have livable wage. Um, the capital investment projects such as this um, do not have that stipulation. Um, I, you know, I definitely want to ensure council and, and, and the mayor pro tem that our attitude, uh, because we, we, a we actually operate a department that has a workforce development arm to it as well. And we work hard to try to place people in living wage jobs with benefits. So it certainly is, is our attitude that, that we, um, we care deeply about that. But we also are um, cognizant of job markets in various industries. And there are you know, certain positions such as retail, hospitality, and tourism that they don't pay, li they don't pay living wage. Um, I do think it's a very viable question to ask any, um, any incentive applicant. Um, but uh, you know, it, it, based upon um, our knowledge of, of uh, the various industries uh, within the Durham labor market and the Triangle labor market and the, the wages that different types of positions tend to pay, um, we think that um, it would be difficult to demand it in this particular case. Um, but certainly asking it, um, I think, is, is a, a very viable question. Mr. Mayor. Recognize Councilman Clement. Uh, I, I'd be very uncomfortable supporting this proposal as stipulated in item 12 of our agenda, knowing that we have excluded consideration of livable wage as a as a, as, as a concept to be incorporated in our contracts with individuals and vendors who do business with us. Uh, is, it, is it too late to revisit this proposal to see whether a livable wage standard could be in, incorporated into this proposal? Is it too late for that consideration? I didn't hear you. Who are you directing the question to? Uh, staff or uh, anybody who wants to answer. Well, Mr. Clement, uh, you know, I would say that uh, too late, you know, until the council takes an action to affirm or deny the request, I, I took that as a rhetorical question that you probably know the answer to, that it's not too late. Um, I think that uh, to some degree we have to get back with the uh, the operator. I believe there will be uh, uh, significant challenges associated with that, as Mr. Dick outlined. I also think there's some consistency questions that uh, are going to come into question, but we'll be glad to uh, pr provide some additional information if the uh, uh, you know the, the representatives from the uh, the applicant want to comment. That's certainly their their prerogative. Um, but we're not prepared to uh, answer those questions uh, to that level tonight. Well, Mr. Madam, Mr. Mayor, uh, in light of what the manager has said, I, I wish we could refer this back to the source, uh, asking that consideration be given to a livable wage concept to be a part of this contractual agreement with the city. Uh, I, I, I would be very uncomfortable to be a part of a proposal that lacks that kind of consideration because each of us is aware that uh, you just can't make it without a livable wage program being part of your uh, business proposal. So if it's not too late, Mr. Mayor, I wish we could defer action on this uh, proposal, asking that it be sent back to the originator to be con to consider the, the feasibility of a living wage concept, and that we be given two cycles 
to consider that the feasibility of that approach and I so move Councilman Clement um, this, as you know this is a public hearing and we do have persons that have signed up to speak right. to include the developer uh, so I, I, I want to at least give uh, those persons have signed up to speak an opportunity to comment on this and at the appropriate time uh, recognize council for any motions they might want to make uh, thank you mr mayor all right is there anyone else on the council that wants to speak on this item before we move to the public hearing now i have one two three four persons that have signed up to speak for this item uh, i want to make sure that is there anyone else w wants to speak on this item that hasn't signed up uh, could you give your card to the clerk please so i can at least know how much time we're going to allocate for this uh, i have julia barbara brown Linda Wilson, uh, Wendy Hillis, uh, Ken Spaulding, and did Miss Miss Peterson give it up? Uh, Miss Peterson. Does anyone else want to speak? Uh, if not, uh, if you would come forth as I have called your name, and let's let's give four minutes initially to persons who want to speak on this item: uh, Julie Barbley Brown, Linda Wilson. Uh, Wendy Hillis, Ken Spalding, and V. Peterson. And I'm just calling the names in order that I got the, got the cards. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. My name is Julia Borbley Brown, and I'm here tonight as a resident of Trinity Park and as a member of the board of Trinity Park Neighborhood Association and past president and a member of the Urban Planning Committee. And we're here to express our support for this project and to encourage you to vote for it tonight. Uh, we think that it's uh, a good investment for the city of Durham, as Mr. Dick has pointed out. And as you may know, the development of this site has been a work in progress for many years since McPherson Hospital moved to another location. Uh, we believe that the hotel will enhance the gateway to downtown Durham with a very attractive building. It will provide jobs in an accessible location and boost business in the Main Street corridor and hopefully provide other job opportunities because of an increase in business in that area. It will provide needed hotel rooms as well. Uh, I appreciate very much on a personal level your concern about the living wage but I would urge you to consider that uh, this project comes before you tonight when, as uh, Council Member Moffitt has pointed out, other projects have come to you in the past year and this criteria has not been applied to those other projects. Having myself worked as a chambermaid in Durham at the Holiday Inn, I know uh, that it's a very difficult position and one that is worthy of good wages. I would hope that uh, Concord, uh, that's been, who's been in this business for many years, would um, be very respectful of all positions and, uh, and honor their workers. But I would urge us not tonight to apply a separate criteria to this project. On a lighter note, I would like to add my uh, personal connection with this address. While the building no longer exists, the parking area of McPherson Eye Hospital was the site of McAllister's boarding house where my parents had their honeymoon on December 3rd, December 4th, 1943. And so I've had a connection to Watt Street for many years. My parents will celebrate their 70th anniversary, 10 children later, 26 grandchildren and 15 great grandchildren. Thank you. Linda Wilson. I didn't see her either. Um, Wendy Hillis. Good evening, Mayor and members of Council. My name is Wendy Hillis, and I am here on behalf of Preservation Durham, where I serve as the Executive Director. I want to echo what Julia just said about the benefits of this project. I think it's in a very important missing link right now when you enter downtown from the west. Unfortunately, a blighted site um, in what otherwise is a very glorious drive into downtown, and I think it's a very important project to have done. We are convinced that this is our last chance to really save this important building, um, that this project and having it happen in a timely manner um, is the only way to save it, that should the building sit for longer periods of time, um, it will be lost, and that an important part of Durham's history would be lost along with it. 
Um, I have been in contact with Peaches McPherson, the widow of Dr. Samuel McPherson Jr. Um, on almost a weekly basis over the past six months, as this has gone before um, County and now you. And I wanted to just give you a little bit of history from her point of view as to why this building is important. First of all, it was constructed in 1926 by the architecture firm of Milburn and Heister. And for those of you who don't know, they were a Washington DC firm who built numerous buildings in downtown, as well as on the Carolina campus, very prolific. But most importantly, it represents a noteworthy chapter in the history of our community. The hospital, which treated diseases of the eyes, ears, nose, and throat, served patients not only from Durham, but from the state of North Carolina, Virginia, and South Carolina. In its prime, over 50,000 patients were seen, and over 20,000 operations 2,000 operations were performed annually on the site. That translates to millions of persons who were treated there annually. Hundreds of doctors, nurses, and other healthcare professionals were trained at McPherson Hospital in conjunction with Duke and UNC. Innovative, site, innovative site-saving care benefited our community and was a hallmark of this creative and progressive institution. In addition, the McPherson Hospital Foundation raised millions of dollars resulting in gifts and grants that underwrote research projects, mission trips, training of professionals, and, and substantial care for the uninsured and indigent. Until its doors closed, no patient was turned away due to financial constraints. So I hope that I have demonstrated why this is such an important cultural building um, in Durham's history, architect important architecturally and culturally. Um, and I would ask that the incentives be improved to save this landmark. Thank you. Uh, Ken Spaulding. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council. My name is Kenneth Spaulding. I represent the applicant. Howard, I want to thank you so much for those kind remarks that you gave to Cora, uh, Dr. Lucas, and to me. Uh, I, I want to uh, ask the mayor if I could just say a, a word in response to some of the questions that were raised, then let uh, CEO Mr. Laporte speak, then I would like to be able to come back and give my presentation. Uh, to try to help clarify and, and, and how to help give a comfort level to you and other members of the council. Uh, as has been said, and I think verified by uh, Mr. Dick, that uh, there had not been this requirement of the other hotels and, and others in the same situation uh, as this uh, uh, hotel and developer. Uh, yet, it was important to us, and I had heard the expressions from some council members about the concern as it related to this and about jobs in Durham. And the discussions had been held with this developer uh, that maybe hadn't been held with others or not, but we wanted it to be held and we, we participated in it. And uh, what we have tried to do is to go over and beyond what anybody else has done, precedent-wise. And we think we've done that. And I think what you're going to hear uh, from uh, Mr. Laporte, uh, you will hear uh, one thing in particular about why we would like to continue to move forward tonight on this. Uh, one of the grave concerns as to why we have expedited and pushed forward as quickly as we have had, as, as we have, has been that uh, you all are very well aware of, of uh, uh, the Federal Reserve and, and what Bernanke and others have said about possible raising of interest rates uh, based on what's been going on um, as far as the economy. And yes, we are Durham, yes, we are North Carolina, but we are impacted uh, by uh, what goes on nationally. Um, this is a very tight deal, project that we have, very tight. And uh, everything can be thrown out of whack if the interest rates go up. And I need your verification of that if, if I'm not speaking the truth. And, um, and so timing is truly of the essence in regard to this. That's why we tried to deal with, instead of a situation of it having to go back for any discussions on this, we wanted to deal with it proactively. And we dealt with Kevin pro proactively to be able to try to enhance and increase and have as much livable wage uh, participation as possible. 
uh, also uh, as far as minority, uh, uh, not just we're not just going to go on what the requirements are as far as minority uh, participation, but we, we, there's some language in that where we're going to try to do even better than what you all have been requiring uh, because we had that separate discussion as well. So I, I would like at this time Mr. Laporte to come forward and then if I could resume my presentation, I'd greatly appreciate it. Thank you. This, this is in response to questions that the council has raised. Is that correct? All right. Honorable Mayor, members of the council, my name is Mark Laporte. I'm CEO of Concord Hospitality and we are the sponsors of the project that we hope that you can approve. I thought first I might give you a few facts. Uh, the fact is that we're going to generate about $11 million in salaries and wages through the construction of this uh, hotel, high paid jobs to many members in the community. Fact is that over eight people full time will be salaried and of course are much above the living wage. Uh, fact is too that wasn't said and should be said that living wage today in this area I believe is $11.91 will actually be very close to that number but starting wages are in fact below that. Many of our folks that work with us for years quickly go beyond that through seniority and just getting raises over time. Another fact is that uh, we as a rather large company with over 4,000 employees are very focused on benefits for our folks uh, and in fact we have a very competitive health and welfare benefits for all full-time employees that uh, otherwise these folks may not have. Another fact that is often overlooked but um, many people that work in hospitality uh, are second wage earners within families, many, many of them. I myself, uh, my wife was a teacher until very recently. So that should not be overlooked. This is often added on to another spouse or significant other salary that in fact would catapult that number, uh, 1191, much, much greater than uh, what it would seem just when you look at the number by itself. So we will create great jobs, great benefits to the community. We're community focused, uh, we're minority focused, uh, and I think holistically, um, we hope you can all see that the benefits outweigh in many, many ways uh, counting what could be a few folks early on that would be, in fact, market forces uh, have us pay less than 1191 at the beginning, but in fact that uh, likely to be a second income within a household. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, members of the council, again, my name is Ken Spaulding. I represent the applicant. Uh, we first want to thank the city manager, Mr. Bonville, uh, the deputy city manager, Keith Caldwell, and the director of the Office of Economic and Workforce Development, Mr. Kevin Dick. Uh, your staff has worked tirelessly throughout the weeks and weekends to work through a plan that totally benefits the Durham City taxpayers and provides a business opportunity that plans to invest approximately $29.5 million in our Durham community. We also want to thank the Trinity Park community, which has been so neg negatively impacted and affected by the present dilapidated eyesore that now exists at the gateway to our Durham downtown community. We want to thank them for their patience and their perseverance in helping this project to protect and preserve the historic character of this area. We also want to thank the County of Durham for assisting this effort with an all-out grant to help secure the success of this venture. This opportunity will bring numerous construction and operational jobs to our city and will significantly enhance our Durham tax base. We thank all of you for getting us here tonight Mr. Mayor and members of the council, our taxpayers, our community, our residents, and our visitors upon approval of this item will all benefit from your efforts and your vision for our community and the city of Durham. Thank you. Welcome. Um, Victoria Peterson. Thank you. 
Uh, Mr. Mayor, um, uh, myself having a visual problem, I, I really understand what it means to make sure that persons uh, get care. But I have some questions. Um, that facility is in walking distance of Duke. I would like to know, and I have not heard, heard, heard anything about Duke being involved with this project. When you leave that hospital, you walk around the corner, a block or two blocks, you are on Duke's property. Tell me why Duke is not involved with this project. And if they're not, can they become involved? Why don't we ask Duke also to invest to put some dollars, since this was a medical, a medical facility, ask them also to put some dollars into this project. I have some concerns, not just the livable wage. When, nowadays, when you speak about minorities, you're talking about a whole lot of folk. And a lot of times when you go on these construction jobs, they're not persons that look like me. They are not African Americans. They are other minorities that live in this community, that come from other communities, Texas, California. We have a huge project going on right now in Durham with city dollars, and you have very few, very few African Americans on that project. I know that because I see it. I've spoken to African American men in this community who cannot get work on that project that we are working on today in this community. What needs to happen, and I've said this in the past, we need to get some kind of reports, ongoing reports on these projects that the city is funding, even if it's a small project. If city dollars are being used, we need to have reports to state how many of those jobs are Durham residents? How many of those jobs, or how many of those subcontractors or companies that live in Durham, white and black? You have white women that are in construction in this area. We need to make sure that if they live here in Durham, that they are going to be able to bid. And then afterwards, three months out, six months out, once those projects are underway and going, somebody needs to come back and give the public, not just the city council, not just at work sessions, not all of us can get to a work session to make sure that these companies are doing and they are delivering what they say that they are doing and delivering. We never hear a report. I have to basically call Mr. Bonfair. I think he tries to do, he tries to do his best to, to give us some kind of information when we ask from the public, but I think sometimes it's good that the city council comes out and gives some reports on some of these huge projects that we're working on to make sure that our contractors and our subcontractors in this community are being employed. And I wanna say that again. Now we're saying, well, we're using the unemployment well, what I'm hearing from some of our projects, that these companies are bypassing the unemployment office. They are not hiring, they are not hiring persons from our local unemployment office. Well, if there's no report, and there's no folks out there in these communities going on these job sites, like I've done in the past, to see who is actually being hired in work, we don't know what's going on, and that is not happening. So that's what I'm asking, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Ms. Peterson. That uh, whatever I, I, we do, will, the reports I, I, are given. Just, just, just a minute, please. Uh, we, we've heard your comments. I, I'll leave it to the developer to talk about who his investment partners are. But uh, just for the record, if, in fact, the council does approve of this agreement, uh, there are quarter reports that are required to be made back to the administration relative to subcontracting, hiring, et cetera. So that, that is a part of the process. I'm going to recognize Ms. Linda Wilson. Linda, you weren't here uh, when I called persons who have signed up to speak. Uh, persons have uh, four minutes to speak. Thank you, I'm sorry I was late. 
My name is Linda Wilson. I live at 302 Watt Street, about a block and a half from this project. And I'm just here to say very briefly that um, the neighborhood has worked with the, the developers for quite a long time. We, of course, went into this expecting that we would get the Taj Mahal. We didn't quite get that, but we're really happy with the project. We feel as if this is a project that um, is appropriate to the neighborhood, both in intent and use and space and um, looks. We're really happy with the, the um, facade of the building and the way the older building will be maintained. So we would ask that you all support this and, and help us help the contractor, or the, or the developer, sorry, um, and thank him for all his many, many, many months of cooperation with us. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, is there anyone else that wants to speak on this item? This is a public hearing. I want to make sure, to, yes sir, can you come up and uh, state your name and address and later fill out a card for the record? Uh, my name is Vince Taylor. Uh, I live at um, 2915 Beachwood Drive. Uh, I am also a small contractor here in the city of Durham, so I have some personal interest, particularly with the, when we're dealing with the job market here in the city of Durham. What I would like to see uh, is that uh, I'm not doing it for my own personal reasons. I care about and accept of our community. I'm, I am on the task of a, of a school called CET, and I volunteer most of my time to teach uh, maintenance skills, whether it be carpentry, electrical, or heat and air conditioning, things of that nature there. So these guys will be, have the equipment to go back into the community to perhaps be employed again. But what I found out at the end of their completion of their graduation with their certificates, they don't have the hope of going out there to get a job. And I would like to see that when the, when the companies come to Durham to, to ask for city dollars to complete a project, that these young men and women that have a glimmer of hope they volunteer to go to school to rehab themselves. So they might have an opportunity. Regardless of what the scars are in life, they endure it. They volunteer to rehab themselves. And then when they come out of that, if they don't have something that can give them some sort of hope, then that diminishes, and that's when we begin to have more crime in our neighborhood. We have more uh, uh, deprivations of our neighborhood, and things of that nature there. So I, I just plead to each and every one here this afternoon to please take that into serious consideration, particularly for this sector of the community. And like I said, I'm volunteering my time. I'm not getting paid for it, but I'm there to teach these young people skills. And they are excited about it. But at the end of their completion, it seems as though the hope it seems to be just dimming in their eyes again. And that bothers me. Thank you all for your time. You're welcome. Is, is there anyone else that wants to speak on this item uh, that hasn't had an opportunity to speak? Uh, if not, let the record reflect that no one else asked to speak. I'm going to close the public hearing and the matters back before the council. And I, I want to say uh, just just a few comments, and uh, and it relates to my opening comments in terms of uh, an opportunities for businesses, local businesses, and uh, minority businesses to participate in in contracts. Uh, particular construction, I'm not talking about livable way, I'm talking about construction part, uh, where city dollars are invested. And although this is a separate project since it has been raised about what has been asked on other projects, uh, I can share with you that I didn't publicly ask the question of 21C, uh, but I did raise the question when they had an opening recep reception over at uh, the uh, hotel a couple of weeks ago with one of the um, developers uh, he hasn't gotten back in touch with me. I've had this private conversation with the city manager uh, to let him know that it was very important to me that when we speak about city dollars being invested in construction projects, especially of this type, that there be some assurances from the developers that we're going to have opportunities and there will be goals for minority participation. So while I didn't raise that specifically 21C on the project, uh, I made it very clear that's a concern of mine and I've shared it with the city manager and I would hope that we're going to have some follow through on that. Uh, in terms of other projects, we, we don't ask this question of every project that the administration brings to us for support. Uh, some of them are very small. But I, I think, and maybe somebody needs to correct me, I think it's a requirement of uh, persons who receive city dollars, especially when we're talking about $7,500, et cetera, thousand dollars, that there be some kind of good faith effort that they require 
uh, an opportunity to have minorities and local businesses to participate in the projects, especially when they're construction projects. Although it's not raised, uh, for me, it's an understanding that that should be happening. And if that isn't happening, then somebody needs to correct me on that. Uh, but I, I just raised that point because the question's been raised about we didn't ask it for other projects, and I want the public to know I've raised the question. And maybe I should have done it more publicly, but it's still a concern, and, and that to me is a standard uh, operating practice that I hope the city has when we invest in these type of projects. Having said that, I, I want to hear other comments. I'm going to recognize the Mayor Pro Tem, Councilman Clement, and Councilman Shul in that order. Oh. Ken and developer, I certainly appreciate, and the neighbor, neighbors, I certainly appreciate all the work that went into this project. And initially, my support for the project was on a personal note too, because it represents uh, one of the last remnants of segregation in Durham. And that building will no longer stand as it did years ago when I was a kid working there in the basement where black patients were. So I'm, I, I support it just to get that uh, piece out of, out of Durham. I, I, and and I'm, I'm still gonna support it, uh, whether you pay the livable wage or not. Uh, since you did give an explanation, there's a possibility within six months to a year, everybody will make a livable wage. Is that, is that close to the truth or? That is close. Our, our beginning wage, the lowest wage, will be $8 and some change, to be exact. Uh, through time, through uh, one success on the job, we give raises. I started in this business as a night auditor, as a minimum page guy, and, and worked hard and got to the next step. I should add, too, that many people that seek jobs in a hotel seek jobs for a short time, for, as a part-time or, or a full-time worker for a period of time because they may be a student, they may be getting on to something else in their life, and it's not often thought as, in fact, we wish it were, but often it's not thought by folks that come to work with us as a career job, but it's to get to the next step. And in that regard, we create great opportunities for folks to do that. So really, I thank you for saying it. You've got to look at all aspects of it, though, for sure. Our maintenance folks, in fact, do make that wage right okay. Thank you for that explanation. I also support it because we need the 143 rooms uh, downtown. I, I serve as a liaison on the Durham Convention and Visitors Bureau Board. Um, but um, if we're going to end poverty in Durham, uh, we've got to take some steps, affirmative steps to do that. And hopefully uh, in time we'll be able to do that. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, Cora. Were you recognizing me or not? You okay. Council, Council, yeah. Attorney Spall, and I'm going to recognize Councilman Clement and Councilman, Mar Councilman Shule and then Councilman Moffitt in that order. If they have questions of you, they're free to, to, to raise questions. Councilman Clement. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, uh, I, I certainly support the concept. I'm just uncomfortable with the way we are going to implement it. Uh, through this discussion, and uh, and I'm just, I, I'm just not happy with what I see as the conclusion of this discussion. Uh, I will put it on record that I will vote against this pro project simply because of its living wage uh, proposition, and I hope that that. That concern will be alleviated as time passes, uh, but I do support the concept that's being proposed by this particular item on the agenda. But I want the record to reflect the fact that I will be voting no. Thank you. Recognize Councilman Shul and Councilman Moffitt. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I had a couple of other. Uh, questions I wanted to ask. I uh, appreciate the discussion very much of the wages and how important that is to all of us as well as the contracting. Um, but for Kevin, I have a question about the, when I look at this, it, it looks to me, just my rough math as the 
the county's putting up, they're, they're putting up $400,000, we're putting up 1.3 something. Uh, looks to me like they're getting about $7 in tax revenue according to this algorithm, according to this model for every dollar they put in and looks like we're getting maybe a buck 35 for every dollar we're putting in. Um, my math is rough, but I think it's pretty close. And can you explain to me the rationale? You know, what is the reason that the city has got a 1.3 something million dollar commitment to this, the county's got a $400,000 commitment, and yet their take on the other end in terms of the taxes is so much greater. Is there a rationale or is it kind of forum shopping by the developer in terms of what they can get? You know, can you give me some sense of that? Well, I, I think I can't necessarily explain that rationale in, in a juxtaposition between the city and county. Uh, I can explain the rationale that um, goes into the rec recommendation we've made this evening um, and that is that um, we have documented evidence from the developer that the project will not be completed um, without an incentive um, that is at the amount we're proposing. Um, it is scheduled to produce a yield um, that I think is pretty favorable to the city um, over eight years, over $446,000. Um, I think that the the incentives uh, that the city and county are given, giving are based upon different methodologies. Um, you know, we're, we're doing ours is more of a, a tax increment finance model, which, which basically states that um, we're uh, paying a percentage of capital investment that is going to provide a yield for us uh, over eight years. And that $446,000 yield we think is, is robust and that it would not happen were it not for the incentive. So um, it, it, it meets, uh, from that rationale, um, from the city's rationale, uh, I, w I would say that um, uh, we stand to, to, to make, it, it's a good deal for the taxpayers from that standpoint. It's also consistent with the but for um, language and concept that's in state statute. So um, looks like maybe Mr. Spalding, had some, do you have a comment on that as well about the city and county thing? Of course, I'm not going to get in a <laughs> fight between the city and the county. But, but I, I heard the word forum shop, and I want to make it very clear that we were not doing that. I, I want to also make it, uh, not that you said we were, but you were asking the question. So I just want to answer that we were not. But what, what we did do, and, and I'm telling you, um, it was hard as the Dickens to get the 400,000. We almost got absolutely nothing. And uh, the way that they were able to craft it and work to where they were able to, to do this, uh, which we're very fortunate that they did um, reverse the decision from the administration to not fund it at all. Uh, but they were able to, with the county attorney and the administration, we were all able to look at it in another way, and that was the emphasis on the preservation. And they were able then to find a way under that uh, legislation that would allow them to be able to do a grant, uh, not something extended over an eight-year period or whatever. And that was able to, with that occurring, I think, within two, or at two years of operation, uh, that was able to save us uh, help us to get to where we are tonight and, and I, I, I want to say that it was not we, we tried 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 and we we were very close to not getting anything but they did and the uh, staff had recommended nothing so uh, we're fortunate in having that four hundred thousand dollar grant we are very appreciative of it and it helps to to make it possible for this to be uh, to be successful economically financially thank you sir Thank you. Um, appreciate that explanation and Kevin, yours. And Kevin, thank you for letting me stop you on Main Street today and ask you other questions. I apologize. I probably shouldn't have done that. Um, I, I, you know, my, my feeling about this is that we need, to, we need something different going forward. Uh, we have 
a policy that isn't rational in terms of the city and the county and, the, and, their, and our respective contributions to these uh, incentive projects. Uh, I understand that small inconsistencies in project to project uh, will occur, but the fact that the county is gonna get on this $7 for every one dollar they're putting in, and we're going to get a buck thirty-five for every dollar we're putting in. And no matter how you cut it, uh, it, it isn't uh, it isn't right. And we've had various projects come before us, and we deal with them on project by project basis. And uh, we 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 don't we we don't want to kill these projects, and so we we go with it. But. It, we need something more rational, and I know we're beginning these conversations between the city and the county, uh, but uh, we, I, I feel strongly that we're getting the, the, uh, the raw end of the deal uh, often. And uh, I know this is not, certainly not your fault, Kevin. I know that your, your, uh, your office presents these things and the, and the county administration and, and commissioners do what they want, but uh, I don't feel it's working out well for us uh, in, this, in, this, uh, in this relationship. Um, and, and I don't hear a rational argument for it. That's the thing. I never hear a rational argument for it. The, the argument for it always is that's all the county will put up. You know, it's, it's what Mr. Spalding just said. You know, that we were lucky to get the 400,000, it's all the county will put up. Well, there needs to be some rational basis for these, for these kinds of policies and decisions, and I hope we're gonna to work towards one. Um, so my other question has to do with the, uh, Ms. Hill has raised the, uh, the issue of, of uh, McPherson Hospital. Of course, we, you, you all have raised it with us many times, and of course, own personal history there. Um, if this project did not go forward um, at this point with this incentive, uh, what would be the, uh, what, what do we expect, Kevin, about the, the future of McPherson Hospital? Do you have any, uh, anything to say about that? Uh, our discussions with the developer have indicated that there's a strong possibility that the property would be sold if this particular project didn't go forward. Um, if that happens, the uh, the future of, of, of the hospital, the future of the building as it stands um, would probably include deterioration, and we're not sure what the future would hold beyond that. I guess I, you know, in, in, in some, I, I will count myself as a very reluctant supporter of this. Um, I'm gonna vote for it, unless I hear something different between now and the end of our discussion. Um, and I appreciate the work that's gone into it on, on the part of your staff. Um, I, uh, I, I think that, you know, in terms of the living wage issue, uh, we need, I don't think we can, should be inconsistently applying that, um, that standard. I, I very much appreciate Howard's point of view and respect his, his, his decision. Um, I think in the long run, if we're going to be enforcing livable wage ordinances on, on all of our contractors and so forth, we are going to be having to subsidize them ourselves because we'll start getting bids that include that higher wage. That'll be subsidized with taxpayer money. I, I don't know that we're at that point yet. Um, and I do think that the city county issue is, you know, we, we have a lot of city county issues now uh, and we need to, we need to wrap this this is a big one, and we need to wrap this into our discussions, Mr. Manager, and I hope we can. Um, I do think that there are some very good things about the project. Uh, I do think that McPherson Hospital is truly an important building. Uh, it is, and uh, I do think that it is, it, is, it is really an eyesore, and I think that the argument could well be made, well, if we waited three more years, we wouldn't be getting the, uh, the income we'd be getting now. You know, if, 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 if we didn't do it three more years later, somebody came in without an incentive and did this, uh, we wouldn't really be, you know, we'd have lost three years of the income that we will be getting for the city. So I'm gonna support it reluctantly, um, and I appreciate your bringing it to us. Thank you, Councilman Shaw. I recognize Councilman Moffitt. Um, okay, so first, um, Mr. Shaw, I'm going to append to what you said. 
one word, which is the word since you left it off. The county is getting actually about six dollars for each dollar invested, and the city is getting thirty-five cents for each dollar. And um, I think I, that I was throwing in our, our our original buck to each. Uh, I, I was uh, I was adding the, the I was adding our base to the uh, to the additional uh, profit there. I cents, just wanted to add the word cents. So if uh, somebody might not have picked up on that when you said we got thirty-five, they might not realize it was thirty-five cents. Uh, for each dollar invested. Um, I wanted to ask a question first of Ms. Willis, uh, uh, Ms. Hillis, sorry. If you could come up. Uh, on your way, I I'm, I'm just want to drill down a little bit on what um, Mr. Shul was asking, which is what kind of designations, uh, the structure that's there today, what kind of designations it has, what kind of protections those designations give, uh, absent any agreement with the city. So the structure has absolutely no historic designations um, right now and no protections. So if yeah, um, there are protections built into this agreement, as I understand it, and I'll confirm that in a moment. But if, um, so at, without this agreement, then what you're saying is that there are no protections for there, the building. There are none. The property is not listed on the National Register of Historic Places. Um, it is not listed as a local landmark, although certainly it would probably be eligible. Um, and it's not in a local historic district. Great. Thank you. Councilman Moffitt, um, the agreement will stipulate um, certain historical architectural elements um, be retained. Um, specifically, uh, I can recite the specific. No, but, I, but there are, what I'm, what my understanding of the agreement is it does provide four protections of the existing structure. That's correct. Okay. Now I have another question, if you would. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't catch your last name, and I know we've had a discussion, but uh, Vince, who's the instructor at CET, raised the issue of hiring locally. Yes. Now, the agreement that's before the city tonight does provide some, uh, some um, stipulations about local hiring. Is that correct? Yes, uh, that the good faith effort be made by the... Um developer and its, its contractors and subcontractors to use the Durham job link um, as a source to recruit talent. Um, that would include the construction positions as well as the permanent positions. As I mentioned earlier, we've formed connections uh, with North Carolina Central University and Durham, Tech, Durham, Technical, Durham Technical Community College to ensure those things. And we also have a relationship with the Center for Employment and Training and we can um, certainly include the graduates that Mr. Taylor alluded to in any types of recruitment events, um, provided that they register with the Durham Job Link. Um, they can be viable candidates for construction positions. This may be stating the obvious, but in the absence of any agreement with the city, uh, none of that would be um, incumbent on the developer of the property, is that correct? We would um, try to encourage it, but it would not be incumbent, no. So for me, uh, I, I fall in the same camp as um, Council Member Shul in that uh, it would be great um, if all of the jobs were living wage. And I think that if we want to revisit our incentives policy to see whether or not we want to make that a stipulation for future any future investments, I think that is a conversation that would be good for us to have. Um, but tonight, the, the proposal that's in front of us has to do with um, protecting McPherson Hospital, encouraging development uh, in this pit um, that exists between downtown and Duke, um, providing um, uh, 31, hopefully, 31 full-time jobs projected uh, half of those at living wage or better. And uh, so I find myself in that position of being a, a reluctant supporter. I'd be happy to continue the case uh, for four weeks to give the applicant an opportunity to look more closely at the living wage issue, but um, if we vote on it tonight, I will be voting in favor of it. Thank you. You're welcome. Recognize Councilwoman Katani. Thank you, Mayor. Um, just chime in here that I share the concern on the livable wage and I raised it when it first was broached with council. So I am relatively disappointed that it hasn't been addressed more fully. 
Um, I do think, and as I have said multiple times, that we do need to relook at our incentive policy and where we provide city incentives and be very clear about what we're getting out of the project whether and what we want to support, whether livable wage or affordable housing or transit or others and, and location. Um, I believe in this case, though, that it's important that the project move forward, and my understanding is that won't happen without city incentives. So um, I'll be reluctantly supporting the project as well. But I will say that we're very enthusiastic about uh, Concord coming here, so the concerns that we're sharing are not uh, I don't know how to say this exactly, but we just want to be sure that you understand that um, we're raising concerns, but we do welcome your participation in the community if this project moves forward. Thank you. Thank you. I, I would, um, I guess, have one, one or two comments. Um, and I, I appreciate the concerns that um, Councilman Shule is raising about the county investment. But I, I guess I would ask, the developer, and I, I guess a couple of things. If the county did not contribute $400,000 to this project, would we be able to do the project? And if your answer is yes, then what it would mean to me is that the county would be getting even more dollars and haven't put anything into it. If they could do it without the $400,000, then the county would rip all, reap, reap all the benefits. If they're saying they couldn't do it, then we dissolve back into where we are now, uh, a project that's sitting there with all the ramifications of what, what we've heard. So while I, I agree we've got to hopefully see how we can do more in this city-county participation, I think being realistic, uh, th we're, we are where we are. If they don't put anything into it, if the county, if the, if the developers can do the project without them, then the county gets all the benefits without having invested anything in it. Uh, if they can't do it without the county's project, county's dollars, then we're back to where we are now with all the other ramifications of, of where we are. Uh, ha having said that, I'm going to ask if there's anybody else that wants to speak. If not, I'm going to call the question on one item that's before us. Uh, the question is what is, is, is before us is whether or not we support the project has been approved, has been recommended uh, along these guidelines, or we don't support the project, or we support it with whether people want to add, add to that. Isn't that a motion? No, it's not a motion. That's, that's what I'm saying. Well, let me say it the other way. I would entertain a motion on the project. <laughs> <laughs> I will move that um, we accept the recommendation of staff and approve the incentives uh, for the uh, Concord Hospitality Project. Heard the motion. Is there a second to that? Uh, there's been a motion and a second. Is further discussion questions on the motion? Here and I'm going to call the question. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Uh, will you close the vote? It passes five to zero. Council Member Clement, are you voting no? Yes. Will Council Member Clement voting no? One. Five to one. Five to one, I'm sorry. All right, thank you. Is there anything else to come before the council tonight? If not, the meeting's adjourned at 8.52 p.m. Thank you.